and Stefan. Uh, so, uh, well, this is a, a talk about uh, Rust for Linux, the project that brings uh, is trying to bring uh, Rust into the, into the Linux kernel, as you probably know. Uh, there will be two parts of the talk. The first is the, a bit about the status, how it works, uh, an introduction, basically, uh, the goals and the, and, the, and the future steps that we will take. Uh, and the other half is uh, about a wish list of uh, things that we would like to see in Rust, perhaps, if possible, uh, which uh, Wesson will, uh, uh, will focus on, uh, Wesson will focus on pinning in particular. So it will be a bit more technical, the second half. Uh, and yes, uh, also, uh, well, of course, thanks for inviting us, as we said. Um, thank you. Uh, I also like to thank everyone that has worked in the project. Uh, here we are only uh, Wesson and, and, and myself. Uh, but there are also other people that uh, you can see in the in the batches that we send to the kernel mailing list. There is a lot of people that has been contributing, and we hope uh, more and more people uh, contribute to the project. Um, yeah, and with that, so uh, let me introduce uh, Rust and the kernel. Uh, so in the in the batches that we send to the kernel mailing list, uh, we 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 said uh, we want to introduce Rust as a second language uh, in the kernel, right? Uh, and some people, of course, uh, uh, say that there are a lot of languages, which is completely right. There is a, there are a lot of languages in the kernel. You see here a, a plot, a logarithmic plot of the of the uh, languages per file. So the the, the y axis is the is the number of files. And as you see, there is a lot of C files, C and header files as well, etc. Then uh, in in uh, in orange color as well, uh, we see we have uh, assembly, a lot of assembly files as well. These I, I, I put in orange because uh, they also go, or normally, more, or at least uh, virtually all of them, go to the final image of the kernel, right? the final binary of the kernel. Um, and then we have Rust, which so far we only have uh, 100 more or less files. Uh, of course, if, if it is merged, because as you know, uh, it's still not in mainline. Uh, but then there are all other, other languages, as you see. Uh, for example, general purpose languages I put, or more or less general purpose languages that are used uh, during compilation or for other purposes, uh, testing, uh, tracing, etc., cetera, uh, using green here, like make files, uh, shell scripts, uh, Python, Perl, etc. cetera. Uh, and there are other uh, files in blue, uh, the device tree files, jump, the kernel configurations, uh, et cetera. So a lot of, uh, of things going on in, in the kernel, a lot of languages. Uh, but yes, uh, what we want to see is that um, Rust, if it, is, if it is merged, we want to see Rust as a first class language in the kernel. And that's why we say it will be the second language in the kernel, second first class language, in the sense that it would be used for most of the, of the uh, or how you say, um, it would be used for, 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 for parts of the final binary, uh, the, the, the binary that you run when you put uh, uh, your Linux kernel. Uh, right now, you see only, uh, if you can go back, please, uh, What's on the uh, you see that it's only 105, but if we got uh, into the kernel and people start really using maintainers and, and developers start really using and companies uh, Rust, it will grow uh, to roughly, basically, to, to the same uh, level as, as C. Maybe not as much, but what we mean is that it will be used. There is one, for example, there is one file per, per module driver or several files. So it will grow and grow and grow. And that's what we mean by the second language, is the second language uh, that is general purpose. Uh, of course, assembly is also a it's kind of a language, but it's not general purpose in the sense that you have to write it for each architecture that you want uh, your code to run in. Uh, and why we want to begin with Rust in the kernel is, well, as you you know, uh, because if, if you're here listening to this, it's probably because you, you like, as well as, uh, as we like, uh, a decreased chance of memory safety bugs. We say decreased chance because, yes, in safe Rust, in principle, it's impossible, but we use unsafe Rust. Uh, there is always a possibility, of course, of bugs in the, in, in the core or other libraries, for example. Uh, there is also, we hope that it also decreases the logic bugs because of uh, stronger typing, for example, and other properties of Rust. There is also, um, uh, we hope that uh, by using Rust, and this is uh, one of the main goals uh, that we want to achieve is that writing drivers, especially at least in the beginning drivers uh, and other kernel modules, is easy. It's easier than with C. You don't have to pay as much attention to detail with respect to, for example, memory safety. Uh, and also for reviewers of that code, because when you submit uh, some code to the, to the kernel, there is people that have to review it. There's a change of uh, reviews. Um, and 
is uh, it would be best that uh, uh, reviewing those drivers is as easy as possible. If I see, for example, as a maintainer, I see that the driver has no unsafe code, then at least I know I'm, I'm not introducing those kinds of vulnerabilities into the kernel. And uh, the last point is also very important because, as you may know, in the, the, the internal kernel APIs, uh, the things that are not exposed to, to user space or uh, and users, basically, uh, are completely unstable in the sense that they may change uh, from release to release. So it's also good to have a, a language that has a strong typing, et cetera, so that the refactoring all, all those uh, drivers is, is easier uh, in the future. Um, and also another goal that we could, we could say is uh, that uh, we have a chance, by using a new language, we have a chance to not fix, but let's say improve uh, other related things. For example, formatting the code, uh, documenting better the code, enforcing some convention for documentation, writing the safety requirements, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so a bit on briefly how, how it works uh, right now in the, the, the support in the kernel. So, what we want to achieve, as I said before, is we want to have Rust drivers in the left side of the, of the, of the slide. We want to write drivers in, in Rust, in safe Rust as much as possible, which call safe abstractions. And the safe abstractions, uh, they, they basically wrap C code. Uh, and for calling the, the C APIs in the kernel, we, we are using unsafe. It's possible that in the future, we may, instead of wrapping C, C code currently in the kernel, it's possible that uh, if Rust uh, takes off, it's possible that we may even write our own, um, uh, say, subsystems, for example, in, in, in the Rust side. Uh, but so far, what we are trying to do is wrap the C APIs, that the one of the, the facilities that exist in the kernel already, so that it can be used safely from Rust. Uh, so we are not trying to basically rewrite the, the kernel. This is uh, what it means. And the forbidden line that you see in the bottom means that we eventually, or ideally, we want to forbid that a driver, a Rust driver, calls directly the C APIs. It may call and save APIs in our abstraction. That's fine. But we want to avoid that they depend directly on the on the C APIs. Uh, we have not achieved this 100% just yet because we have, we have been working on the project, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but basically, this is the goal. And we don't want to we don't allow basically to introduce new um, new calls directly into the C APIs. So basically, we have to close the gates uh, a bit more. But then uh, we will be able to enforce actually uh, that there is no. Um, Bindings in the in the in the leaf modules, let's say. Uh, then uh, a bit a bit more into detail, going closer into that diagram. Uh, as you see, the left side is a is a is a driver. We will have right now a kernel crate where which contains a single crate uh, that contains all the abstractions that wrap the the, the different C structures and APIs, etc. Uh, and, the, and in order to call the C APIs on the on the on the C kernel side, uh, we use Binder, the, the Binder tool that you probably know about, which generates uh, takes headers or function signatures or declarations in C and gives you uh, unsafe uh, APIs to call. Um, for all this, uh, which we can say we can see the next slide, please, Weston. For all this, uh, uh, we are using uh, currently. Are basically in, in the kernel there is a custom build system we could say it's called uh, K build uh, and there is a custom configuration system if you will uh, because the kernel has a lot of flags a lot of gates a lot of uh, options that you can configure at compile time uh, for example uh, for changing the frequency of something or to enable a driver or to disable a driver or to make it a built-in or a external module etc so uh, that system is K config and all these two together basically do everything right now in the kernel. So um, for compiling and doing all this uh, um, to make everything work, we are using uh, the same build system as the as the uh, as the kernel does right now. So we don't use, for example, Cargo. Uh, and Cargo uh, we use for for build testing the uh, for building a sysroot of, of the core analog crate, but we don't use it an STD, but we don't use it for uh, compiling the kernel itself. Um, so yes, and, and with that, the, the crate that we have, which is what we, you see in this diagram, the crate that we have and how they are distributed, from the Rust tree, we use the core and other crates. Uh, but right now, uh, there is an exception in that we copy the alloc crate into the Linux kernel tree, a subset of the alloc crate, because we need a few um, uh, new methods and perhaps in the future modifications, we, we have to see. So what we do is uh, we keep it in sync. 
uh, or changes with uh, with upstream. Uh, but in the future, ideally, we will be able to use uh, alloc, uh, the vanilla alloc, if you will. Uh, then alloc depends. Uh, sorry, the kernel crate depends on alloc. Uh, we use alloc. We also have a built-in crate, which is uh, to substitute the, the compiler's built-ins, basically. Uh, we also have a macros uh, crate that I have in a different color here because it's, uh, it runs, as you know, in the, in, it doesn't run in the kernel itself. It runs in the, in the host when you compile. Uh, there we have all the macros for the moment. So as you see, it's very uh, like a basic setup so, so far where we have all the structures in the kernel crate. We have all the macros in the in macros crate, etc. Uh, we also have other things like sports and helpers, which are uh, basically a workaround, if you will, or a way to call into the, into the, into the C APIs. Uh, the helpers go to Bungie, um, and the and the sports are for exporting via um, a C macro the, the symbols for for external users for external modules. Um, and one particular thing here uh, with the helpers uh, is that currently, for example, we we write all the helpers uh, manually, uh, where a helper is not is not the header that we use from the from the kernel that Bungie generates. But the helpers are more for, for example, when we need to use a C macro uh, that is sufficiently complex that binding cannot generate it automatically for us. For example, say uh, a macro that uh, declares a module, let's say. Uh, so for those things, we have to create a wrapper function in C that then binding can call it. So it's fine, it works. Uh, we have been uh, working that way so far, but perhaps uh, in the future we could uh, devise other, other, other ways of, of making it. Uh, then, uh, yes, uh, a bit on the status. Uh, we wanted to talk about a bit of the status. Uh, so far, it's experimental still. Uh, it's not meant, the, the Russian port we have, is not meant to use to be used in production just yet. Uh, not just because we use unstable features, as we will see in a moment, but also because, uh, uh, well, there are, other, uh, there, are, there are many things that we have to take care of, uh, details and details and details that we have to take care of. Um, but even if it is experimental, it works and it's useful already to work on write new abstractions for subsystems uh, and other things. It's also useful for writing drivers, drivers that work, the drivers that are virtually uh, written in safe routes. Uh, and we have already some examples uh, for drivers and modules. For example, we have a GPU driver, and uh, the binder uh, module is not exactly a sun, but it's, uh, it's an IPC. And that uh, works. Uh, yes, uh, it's next. Uh, so, and next steps on on what we are doing. First of all, um, for the infrastructure, there, there are two main parts of what normally we, when we submit uh, the, the patches to the kernel release, we talk always about uh, two parts. One is the infrastructure, the build system, and everything else that has to go into making this work. And then there is the actual Rust code that is probably the most interesting for you. Uh, so for the first part, the infrastructure, we want to have a full test framework that allows us to, to uh, test code, not just in the host, which we already have, but also, the, for example, the examples in documentation we test. But we want to have, uh, for example, the examples that depend on, on some hardware feature or some um, uh, kernel feature, we want to run them in the, in, the, in the kernel itself. And we also want to have tests and a, an easy way to write them to run them in user space for the target. So not in the host, but uh, for, for the target. These are similar to tests that already exist for C. Uh, there is uh, two self-tests and key unit tests, uh, key unit tests, sorry, uh, in the kernel for this kind of thing. So we want to have parity there. And it's something we are working uh, soon on. Then we also want to uh, upstream and keep as, as reasonably close uh, alloc in sync with uh, what is upstream. We want to remove restrictions um, uh, on the on the Rust support, this means uh, when you configure the kernel, there are a lot of options, right? And some of these options require extra work on our side to support. Uh, there are all, all kinds of options in, in the kernel, for example, for the toolchain, uh, uh, for well, yeah, there are many many options that we have to uh, and features that we have to work on in order to be able to activate the Rust support when 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 the user wants to have them enabled. And many of these are actually used in production, so we need to have the support for that, and we want to work on that. Then we also have to complete the architecture support, perhaps even add more architecture. We have a few of them as examples, basically. Uh, and then on the other side, the abstractions and drivers, of course, more and more uh, facilities. Basically, this means wrapping more and more data structures, more facilities from, from uh, more primitives from the 
from, from the kernel side. For example, uh, we have a mutex uh, from we want to have, we, ideally we would like to have every single uh, facility in the, in the C side to be able uh, to be usable for the, for the Rust drivers as well. Uh, we are working on uh, a DICE uh, uh, module as well as an NVMe one. Uh, we are also working on a working report. Uh, basically, Wesson is all doing this, uh, this, uh, this work, and um, he may talk about that later a bit. Um, then, uh, finally, uh, and this is the most important uh, goal, is uh, my lane, uh, uh, which means getting merged to the kernel, because uh, the previous two slides are about what we are working on, right? In order to accomplish this, which is the main goal, which is getting into a kernel so that people can start actually using it and are confident that uh, even if it is merged as experimental, as an experimental feature, uh, at least people can see that it's there, it's working, it's being tested uh, with the rest of the, of, the, of the kernel code, and we start iterating there. Uh, and in order to do this, there are two main, we can say, uh, uh, things we have to accomplish. Uh, one is getting support from as many kernel maintainers as possible. For example, um, uh, if we want to have uh, GPIO drivers in the kernel, we have to actually contact the GPIO maintainers uh, because the kernel, as you may know, is like divided in many, many uh, sections uh, and subsystems, sub, sub, subsystems, and there are maintainers for each piece, for each of these pieces. And we don't want, and we cannot really be experts or, or try to write uh, all wrappers and, and have uh, knowledge on all, every single uh, of these subsystems. So the idea and what we want to accomplish is that key maintainers of some uh, individual sections of the kernel uh, that want to use Rust and that they want to uh, uh, use it uh, as early as possible, have them uh, on board, have them uh, review the code, understand the code we're writing, even if we write the code in the beginning, but have them um, understand and support us. Uh, there. And then if the Rust support becomes non-experimental at some point, then they will be already uh, ready because that's that's the, basically the main, uh, the main thing. So, one key thing is getting support from kernel maintainers. Uh, we have already support uh, from a few of them, but we are looking into, into, uh, into getting even more and more. Uh, and for that, a uh, sub or a second thing we have to do is providing learning resources, documenting things we are doing as much as possible, uh, answering the questions from maintainers, from other kernel developers, etc., so that they are confident that first this works, this is uh, an improvement over what we are doing in C. And uh, yes, basically uh, convincing, if you will, uh, everyone, the, the people that is on the, that there are, of course, people that don't want this in, there are other people that want this in the kernel. So we have to convince those that are uh, in the middle, basically, and they are still deciding whether the extra complexity, the extra burden of learning Rust is, is worth it. Um, and then, um, uh, yeah, and then we have uh, the second part of the talk, which is a bit of a wish list uh, of, uh, I mean, first of all, we are not experts uh, in Rust. Uh, uh, we, we know uh, uh, we have worked with Rust, but we are not experts uh, uh, in that sense. So basically we have been using Rust uh, to the better of, uh, to the best of our abilities. And we have found some things that we would like perhaps to, uh, to not improve or to fix, but perhaps uh, things that we would like to have or things that we, we think would be an improvement to the land if, if they were there. Um, uh, first of all, uh, well, in, this is what I said. Uh, we, this wish list, uh, we, we are going to focus, Watson is going to take, uh, after a couple of slides, we're going to speak about pinning. Uh, but there, are, there is a long list of wish list uh, wishes that we have. Uh, and you can see the Rust uh, CTCFT uh, session uh, there that were, we were invited to talk about uh, about uh, this wish list and we go into detail there about uh, things that we have seen. So the first thing uh, are the unstable features, of course, this is the obvious one, right? Uh, we keep a live list of unstable features we are using uh, in that link. Um, but ideally, um, uh, I mean, ideally we want as soon as possible to not get rid, but uh, to, to find a way to compile the kernel uh, with uh, as few unstable features as possible. It's not really, um, it may not be required to reach the point where we are in, com in a stable completely, but we really, really need at least a promise that those features will not suddenly completely break, at least when the kernel decides uh, that uh, it's going to be used in production, basically. Uh, so we can get merged. This is fine for the moment, 
But at the point where we want to use to be, this to be used in production, we really have to say this is the point where, where code will not break in the future, at least not in a major way. Let's say. Um, so these are the unstable features. I keep the list here. The ones in bold are like the important ones that currently we have. This may change. Uh, but yes, as you see, there are quite a few. Uh, there are others that can be work around. The ones that are not in bold may be work around or not. But uh, yes, if you want to have more, more details, go to the list or to the, the talk that I described. And then um, uh, just to, to start a bit with the wishes, uh, this is an easy one that we want to uh, highlight, which is uh, having unsafe op in unsafe FN. Uh, this is a lint currently in, in Rust, as you probably know, uh, where uh, having it denied means that the, the unsafe functions don't have an implicit uh, uh, block in them anymore. So you can go, the language would change from writing, for example, something like in the left to something in the, in the right side. We think this is... Uh, we agree make, with making it a hard error because we think the language uh, should be like this by default. Uh, we think it's orthogonal whether a function is unsafe or whether it contains unsafe blocks. Uh, and yes, we would be uh, it would be really great, for example, for Rust twenty twenty four. It would be uh, the default. I mean, it's, this is not something we we uh, need in the sense of a, an unstable feature, but it's a wish that, that we have. Um, and with that, uh, we have the pinning side of talk, which Wetson uh, will talk about. Wetson has been working a lot on the abstractions. He is uh, doing uh, the main work on the abstractions and the, and, the, and the driver details. And he has been fighting with pinning uh, for, a, for a long time now. So he, he wants to uh, give you uh, his, uh, his experience with pinning and where it could be perhaps uh, improved. Uh, with that, uh, thanks. And Wetson, all you have. Thank you. Thank you, Miguel. Um... Yeah, so, so, so now we're going to, to as, as Miguel described in the beginning, we're going to switch gears. It's going to be uh, a little bit more technical with more code and some diagrams here. Uh, so we're going to talk about pinning. And uh, the reason uh, uh, pinning is, 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 is important to us is, is that in a lot of drivers, uh, in fact, some, some uh, real production drivers uh, that, that we convert or we look into, uh, pinning is, is the one source of unsafety uh, for us. So, so really, what what we'd like to see is 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 these unsafe requirements, like the need for these unsafe blocks to 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 go away. So we, we're going into um, uh, some of the reasons why they, they are needed at the moment. Um, so uh, b before we go into that, uh, a little bit of, of background on this principle that 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 we follow and that Miguel already uh, uh, described briefly in, in in previous slides. But uh, the principle is that we 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 use existing. Uh, C kernel code. We try to avoid reinventing the wheel and re-implementing things uh, in, in Rust if they're already available in, in, in C. And uh, well, the, the, main, the main reason is that the subsystems are currently written in C, so we do have to interact with, 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 with C uh, at the moment anyway, even, even if we didn't want to. Uh, we have to because uh, that's, that's, that's where the code is at the moment. Uh, 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 most of this uh, C code is, is, is battle tested in production. It has been used in production, and at least for the for the happy paths, the common paths, we know that uh, they 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 work. Uh, another reason is that, uh, and in fact, this this last reason that I have listed there is mostly for cases when uh, we already have uh, a a Rust uh, implementation of of something, and uh, we also have a C implementation in the kernel, and in in most cases we end up choosing the, 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 the kernel version over the, the C version. And in most cases, it's, it's because uh, there are certain choices that we can make when, when, when we are writing code. And uh, these choices are, in some cases, different between user space and, 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 and kernel space. And I'll, I'll give you a, a little example uh, in, in the next slide uh, about a case uh, where we, 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 we see these kinds of choices uh, and, and where things make sense in one case. but. Uh, not as much in, in the other case. Um, and um, so we, we, we use this, this uh, reuse existing C code, and then people may, may ask, well, if we're using C code, what's the point of, 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 of doing Rust, right? It would be no better. Uh, and as Miguel already pointed out in, in one of the previous slides too, uh, what we are doing is we are building this, this safe and hopefully zero cost. And I'll have some more, a little bit more to say about the, the, the zero cost here. Uh, abstractions around this C code, right? So, so what, what we are doing is we have C code uh, that we want to reuse, but we 
abstract it away in, in, in a safe way uh, to, to, to Rust code, uh, Rust uh, uh, drivers. Um, and, and, and the idea is that uh, we'll benefit from, from, from this, uh, uh, well, from the safety properties that uh, uh, Rust offers us. Uh, so here's here's uh, an example of, of of we feel is a successful example of of reusing uh, existing C code in 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 the kernel. So what what uh, what we had here the options is in Rust we have Arc existing Arc and it's in 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 Libalog. So we could we could use it if we wanted. And in fact we when we started we we were using this. Uh, and we have a, a, a competing uh, implementation of this in on on the C side in the kernel that is RefCount T. Okay, uh, they are slightly different. Uh, so they both just do reference counting and atomic reference counting, meaning that we use atomics to increment and decrement ref counts so they can happen uh, concurrently. Uh, but uh, the implementation is slightly different. Uh, the, the C version has less uh, um, features. It doesn't have like weak references, for example. So they, they actually, the implementation uses just one 32-bit integer uh, of, of, of extra space that needs to be allocated when you allocate an object, whereas the Rust version uses two words uh, but this is not all, all that, that relevant. I mean, basic differences. But the most relevant uh, difference for us, and this is what drove us to, 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 to replacing Arc, removing Arc basically from our, uh, uh, so we never use Arc anymore. We use this, this other thing that we implemented. Uh, is, is the behavior when, when these, uh, uh, these counts uh, overflow, right? So if, if you actually have a bug in, 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 in the code, where you you forget to decrement the ref count in some in some code paths, um, uh, and in fact this is harder to 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 get to with Rust, but it can happen, right? You can actually uh, forget a, a ref counted object, and then the drop doesn't get called, and so the decrement never happens. This could happen in in, in Rust too, and it's not unsafe for this to happen. Uh, however, this can be a source of of unsafety if if attackers notice that that uh, this is happening, and they actually trigger the repeated uh, leak such that eventually we overflow this count, right? And then when we overflow this count, if nothing is done, what happens is that the count goes to zero, right? We think that, uh, oh, actually it goes to one eventually. Uh, and then one successful decrement brings it back to zero. And then we think that we need to free it and then we free it. And now we have a dangling pointer, potentially several dangling pointers, uh, uh, actually the same, pointing to the same place that has been freed, but in several places potentially. Anyway, so there's a security issue there and a, a safety uh, issue there, memory safety issue there. So what we have to do is we have to realize when these overflows are, are happening and we have to react to that. The, what Rust does really is, is um, uh, aborts. It aborts the process. It stops running the, the process. It's not a panic. It's an abort, right? Uh, which makes sense in user space, right? You're running a process and in some inconsistent state and we just want to kill it and have it restarted if it's a service, for example. It makes sense. Uh, in, in user space. But if it's in the kernel, what we're doing is we're bringing down the whole kernel. The whole machine is coming down, or virtual machine is coming down uh, because of this. So we'd like to, to avoid that. Uh, and the, the, what, what the kernel does is it uh, saturates the count, right? So when you see it's about to overflow, we put it at some, some, some value uh, and, and we leave it at that value. Uh, so we never free the memory. So we have a leak, but we don't, uh, uh, but we don't uh, violate safety, basically. Uh, and we keep on running. Um, and um, well, we, we did that and we made it look very much like, like Arc. And, and actually to do that, we had to use some, some unstable features. Uh, so this is actually one thing that we'd like to see uh, stabilized. If you can think of, uh, if you wanna split things in themes, uh, the theme here is uh, let uh, anyone who wants to replace Arc to be able to replace it without having to use unstable features or compile internal uh, features. Uh, uh, but anyway, since, since we, were, we, we were implementing a new version of, of, of that, we made some, some slight changes too. For example, we removed get mute, uh, which means that it's, it's pinned automatically. Uh, so when you allocate uh, some memory and it's ref counted, it's pinned. Um, now, uh, why, why, why uh, does, does, does the spinning matter to us, right? I've been talking about reusing C code, but what does it have to do with, with, with pinning? And, and the answer is, a lot of the kernel uh, data structures on the on the C side are, are self self referential, right? And and the the, the problem with it being self referential, and, and by self referential I mean that there are fields in it that point to itself, right? It can be directly direct direct pointer a field to another field or to the top of the struct, 
or it can be indirect, right? Well, like a field points somewhere else that points somewhere else that eventually comes back to this to this object. So we can have this self references can be direct or indirect, but we have lots of those. We have them all over the place uh, uh, in the kernel. In some cases, we actually need them to uh, we need these these objects uh, to be pinned. Uh, oh, actually, so. Uh, What's the relevance of being self-referential to, to pinning? And, and the relevance is, if there, is, there are these self-references, we want to have this pinned so, so that uh, they cannot be moved. And because when they are moved, then uh, this pointer does not get updated. And I'll, I'll show you in more details in a second uh, how, how this happens. Uh, so in, 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 on the C side, we actually have some cases when we need to, to pin the, 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 these objects uh, from the beginning. So right after we allocate the object, we need to, to pin it before we can use it. There are some cases where we don't actually need to allocate it right away, but like we can, uh, we don't need to pin it right away, but uh, later on. Uh, and I'll show you two examples: one for the first case, and, and another one for the for the second case. And and I'll show you uh, what what the problems are and the ergonomics and some possible solutions uh, uh, that 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 the the language may choose to to to, to adopt in the future. Uh, so let's let's get started with with uh, the first example, one in which we need to initialize things before they can uh, we need to pin things before they can be used. Uh, here we have uh, let me see if my highlight yeah here here we have the the the, the definition of of a, a mutex in in the kernel. Uh, the actual uh, fields are not all that relevant for 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 our discussion, uh, but I'll I'll point one thing out is. Uh, when when these mutexes are used in the kernel, the way they're used is usually you have this mutex declared somewhere, and then before you use them, uh, you you have to call this mutex init function, uh, which takes the mutex, not initialized yet, it will initialize it. Some extra arguments that are not relevant to our to our discussion. They're here just for completeness. Uh, but amongst the fields uh, here, there's one that is very interesting, which is this waitlist, um, which has type uh, uh, list head. And this, this is actually, as, as I point out here, it's a intrusive, circular, doubly linked uh, list, which means that when we initialize it in this mutex init, what we're going to have in this, we're going to have a, a struct like this. There are some fields here, some fields here, and then this is the wait list. There are two fields within uh, this wait list, next and previous, right? When we initialize them, uh, next points to, to, to the to wait list, and previous also points to, to to the waitlist. So this is this is the the part that I say it's circular, right? Uh, and 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 in here we have the self references that I was talking about. And this in this case it's actually a direct one. We have the object pointing to to itself. Okay. So this is on the C side. Uh, on the on the Rust side. So this is this is our abstraction. And and if you look at it, it's it basically boils down to a mutex and the object that we are protecting. Um, and and. Uh, the, 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 the implication of having this, this mutex here is that we have the same sort of thing happening on the Rust side as well, of course, because it's just wrapping this, the C side. But we have our uh, mutex instance here. We have some fields here, which are coming from mutex. We have some other fields here, also coming from mutex, but we also have our data down here. But the idea is that uh, next, if, if in our new, for example, we initialize, we call that mutex init, what we'd see is that uh, we have this, uh, next pointing to, to 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 the list head, and the same thing for previous. Previous would would, would also point there. Um, and um, as I said before, there's an issue with that, and I'm I'm going to show you this. This diagram is is, is the one that uh, uh, brings this this home, right? So this is uh, how things are initialized. This is uh, how things are done normally in in Rust. There's not nothing unusual here. Okay, we have some struct that has some inner field that is a mutex, right? And this ref is, is our implementation of R. So we're trying to create a ref counted instance of my struct that has a mutex in it, right? Uh, so if we, if we look at how this would uh, uh, be, uh, would run, uh, would, would be executed at the runtime, this is what, what uh, we get, right? Uh, there is a, a, a call to, to, to mutex view. Uh, we initialize our pointers if we, if we call mutex init then, and this is allocated on the stack, okay? Um, and then what happens is uh, ref new is called with with this mutex initialized on the stack. And in fact, there are there are two uh, stack instances here that can be optimized out. So, given that this optimization exists, I will consider that there's just one uh, for for our argument here. Um, uh, so so we are we are in this state, okay? And then we call uh, ref new. Ref new actually allocates some memory uh, on the heap 
right? That is that is ref counted, uh, and eventually we'll we'll have we have something like this. We have mutex and we have the ref count up here, but this is on the heap, right? And what it does is it moves this argument here into this new heap allocation. So this object that we had initialized here with those pointers pointing to itself are just going to be copied bit by bit uh, to the to the to the heap, right? And so the situation we end up with is this one. And this is the, 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 our source of, of problems, right? It's because now our heap allocated and ref counted uh, uh, thing that has a mutex in it uh, now has pointers to the stack, right? And to, not only to the stack, to an object that existed in the stack and uh, it's going to be automatically uh, popped from the stack. So it's pointing to, to memory. It's a dangling pointer, basically. Uh, and whenever we try to actually access this, Will mutate this 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 uh, stack region, and this is really bad. Uh, that's that's the, the the source of lots of vulnerabilities. It's these sorts of things uh, that C allows you to do, uh, and, and we're trying to prevent uh, uh, that from from happening on, on the Rust side. Um, so what what did we do uh, to 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 address this problem? Right. So we 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 defined this this new uh, constructor, and we had to make it uh, make it unsafe. Right. So the idea here is that uh, the mutex initialization doesn't happen in our new. Uh, our new just uses some uninit uh, version of, 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 of that mutex. And the safety requirement, uh, which, which we annotate here. So this is actually a convention that we use. Miguel talked about having uh, improved conventions, or not improved, like, so, well, new conventions that we can enforce from the get-go because this is a new project. Uh, so we actually have this convention where we say, if uh, you define a unsafe function, you must have a documentation uh, uh, section, and that must have a safety uh, section in it. And you must specify what it is that you need the caller to, to do uh, uh, in order to use your, your unsafe function safely, right? So what, what, what we do is we say, we, we say, we, we say uh, well, after initialization, you can move it, you can do whatever you want, but before you actually use the, the mutex, you have to call uh, init lock, okay? And this is the source of, of, of uh, unsafety for us. And this is uh, the result of, of, of uh, our implementation, the, the poor ergonomics, right? Uh, we have uh, initialization has to be done in two steps. Uh, first step um, allocates uh, the object on the stack. And uh, at the moment we use this unique ref is to, is to be able to initialize objects and we guarantee there's only one pointer to it. And this is a result of us not having the get mute anymore. So once the object is, is, is shared, it cannot be muted, uh, mutated anymore because it has been pinned, right? So when you allocate, you make it unique ref, uh, but anyway, it's not relevant here to the discussion at the moment, but um, we do uh, mutex new, right? And we can move it around and it's all fine uh, because the pointers are, have not been established uh, yet. Uh, and we have this, we have to have this safety annotation here saying that uh, mutex init is, is, is called below. And we have a macro. Uh, to do that, so this is this is the, the 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 problem with the ergonomics that we have today. First, we introduced uh, the the unsafety, uh, and 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 now we're forcing people to 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 have to call this uh, uh, mutex in it. Now we've looked into uh, trying to avoid that. For example, um, options are doing things like um, when you call mutex in it, instead of returning a mutex, we return some some other type, right? That cannot be used as a mutex uh, only after you you. Uh, initialize it, and then you have a mutex type. Uh, we could do something like that, but it wouldn't work here because we actually need a mutex type to initialize inner in this case here, because inner is a mutex to 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 this inner type. Um, so this is this is the 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 state we're in now with the with the, with the poor ergonomics. What uh, one possible solution for for this is to. Uh, uh, is, is to is to change instead of actually. Uh, before I, I talk about this 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 uh, thing, there's another unsafe here which I'll talk about too because it's related to 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 projection. I'll talk about it in the next uh, example. But uh, so what what we'd like to see really is is something like this, right? Uh, still two steps, but with no unsafes, right? The idea is uh, we call uh, try new uh, uninit, right? So we're basically creating an instance of mystruct that hasn't been initialized yet, so it's maybe uninit uh, mystruct here. Uh, and then here we initialize all the fields of, of my struct, and then eventually we call into, which converts it from unique ref, un uh, maybe uninit, to just ref of, of, of my struct, right? Uh, and and the, 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 the hard part here is that uh, we need to 
ensure that all the fields have been initialized, right? So in fact, we can already do this uh, nowadays with unsafe. Like if, if we do something like this, and here we can use adder of mute and initialize all the fields manually. And instead of doing this into here, we can do assume init, right? But this assume init is itself uh, unsafe. Uh, so we'd like to avoid that. So what, what we need from the compiler is, is a way for the compiler to, between these two blocks, uh, ensure that all the fields have, have been initialized. And of course, we don't want like a, a general solution to all possible uh, ways that, that somebody could, could write some code here because then we get into the halting problem and having to do static analysis and it's impossible basically. That's not what we're asking for. We're asking for like a very limited uh, sort of, 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 of solution where perhaps we just have uh, statements here that initialize each one of the fields, right? And what we'd like to see is the compiler check that for us. And if we leave one, one uh, uh, field out, then the compiler fails compilation for us and says this is, this is uh, not fully initialized. So we can't safely assume that it is. Uh, uh, fully initialized. And this sort of, of thing already happens when you, if I go back to the, to the previous step, when you do something like this, if you do like my struct and you, you do the curly braces and you put the fields in here, the compiler, of course, checks that you've specified all the fields. And if there are no, some fields missing here, uh, then, then uh, the compiler uh, uh, fails the compilation. We want something similar to that, but instead of having the curly braces and, and, and the types colon and, and some function, uh, we actually want to have pointers to these things and to be able to initialize them, them in place. Uh, so this is what uh, ideally we'd, we'd like to see. Another thing that I should say here is this is one possible solution, right? Uh, uh, if people come up with different ways that allow us to do the initialization, we, we'd be happy with that too. As long as it's like, it doesn't have as poor ergonomics as we have at the moment with, with all, all, all the unsafety. So this is it for, for the first example where we, we needed uh, pinning to happen before things can, can, can be used. Uh, we'll go now into the, into the second example, which is when uh, we, we need uh, uh, pinning later on, on the lifetime of, of, of an object. And the problem here is, is, is one of uh, uh, projection. Um, and, and, and the example we have here is missed devices. Uh, what, what the way missed devices are implemented on the C side of the kernel is uh, you have to, to specify a pointer to a struct of this type, and you have to initialize some fields. Uh, and then what the kernel does is, uh, once you register, is it uses this field here to add this MISC device to a doubly linked, intrusive, and circular linked list, the same type of list that, that we talked about. One thing that I, I, should, I should say here, there's actually a, a talk uh, from or Q&A with Linus Torvalds where uh, uh, he talks about taste in programming. And this is actually the example that, that, that he uses. Because one possible solution for us would be to, to say, oh, let's not use uh, lists of this type in the kernel, right? So let's uh, use something else. Uh, but uh, perhaps in the future, we may try to do this, but this is not something realistic now. And another thing that I should say is I've worked on other kernels. So for example, I worked on the, on the NT kernel, which has a huge code base. I've seen some uh, BSD uh, uh, kernel code too. And all, all three of these, one data structure that they have in common is this sort of, 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 of lists. The implementation is slightly different, but the idea is the same. It's intrusive, it's circular, and it's doubly linked, right? And it gives you lots of, of, of advantages. Uh, and that's why pretty much all, all the kernels use this. You don't need to get, to get into, into that. But, but basically, uh, here we have this, this, this list, uh, this uh, struct that has a list in it. And uh, here, uh, the, the self-references are, are, are indirect, right? Because what's, what's, what's happening, what happened in, in, the, in the first case was we actually had a list head uh, and, and, and the list head was just pointing to itself when we initialized. This one, there's a list head somewhere else, right? And, and, and this element, this instance is being added to that list head. So the, the, the self-reference is interacting in the sense that uh, we have uh, next, next is gonna point somewhere, that may point somewhere else, that eventually gets to the head, and head uh, points to, 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 miss, to this misc lab. And this is where the self-reference uh, uh, exists. Uh, so uh, our, our abstraction, is, is one called uh, registration. It's a registration of a MISC, MISC device. Uh, we have new, which unlike uh, the, the uh, mutex case, it, it's not unsafe. So it's okay to allocate this because we don't have the self-reference yet. Uh, but then when you call register, uh, you are required to pass a pinned uh, version of, of the thing. So between new and register, you, you have to pin your, your object before you can, you can, you can call register. Uh, and, 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 and between these two is where the, our unsafe requirement is uh, in, in most cases, and we'll talk about it in the next slide. But before I, 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 I go there, uh, I'd like to point out that uh, we actually have this uh, helper function here 
that's called new pins that will merge these these two things, and there's no unsafety involved here, right? So what it does is it allocates some memory, uh, pins it, and then calls calls register. And here's the type: it's a pin box, right? It's just not it's not just pin. Uh, it's a pin box. Uh, the problem with this is is that well, it's not a problem. Uh, the one fact about this is that it allocates memory, right? Uh, and so it's it's not always the, the 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 thing that you want, and and I'll tell you why in in a second. Uh, so why is that an issue? I, I've already sort of uh, uh, talked about this. Is I, as I said uh, before, between new and, and and register, you actually need to 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 pin your your object, right? So the idea is if you have a struct, and in this struct you have uh, multiple objects that need to be pinned. Okay, for example, you have a mutex inside the thing, you have a MISCLAB registration, maybe you have a net filter registration, they all need to be pinned, right? Uh, so you actually have the option to do the dynamic allocation. But, but then what's happening is you have a field, uh, you have a struct with three of these, then you have three allocations plus the allocation of, of, of the, the extra object, which is not something that is required in C, right? And this is what I, I try to, to, to to, to this, I'm, what I'm alluding to here in this in this item, where I'm saying this prevents the, the the zero cost, right? And if we were to only provide the new pinned version to to users, then the the people who are used to C and doing things just the C way would would like point out to that and say, oh, you guys claim that you are zero cost, but you clearly are not. There's more uh, allocations here, and it's not just the the fact that we allocate more. There's a locality of data and uh, cache lines and uh, the, the, the people working on such low level uh, code in, in not always, but in a lot of cases, they do care about this. They do care about the, the layout and how to optimize uh, the cache lines such that fields that are used together are closed and uh, are close together and, and share a, a cache line. Uh, so uh, uh, this is the situation we have now uh, to, to, to actually, if, if we have the, in this case, we have the outer object P uh, is pinned, the object itself is pinned. Right? But the fields of this object are not necessarily uh, pinned. And to claim that they are pinned, then you need this unsafe block, which, which, which uh, does the, the projection. Uh, and then you can call uh, register on, on it. And uh, this is the, the other uh, unsafe that we saw, even in the, in the mutex example. OK. Um, go to the next one. Uh, a possible solution for that. And, and in fact, there is, there is, there is a crate that, that does that with a proc macro. Uh, uh, but uh, we're trying to avoid that, uh, and we can we can talk about this uh, in, in Q and A. But uh, so what we'd like to see is really uh, uh, language support for, for for this sort of thing, right? So uh, for example, in, in 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 annotations, right? So when you when you declare your my struct, right, you could perhaps add some annotations where you say misc. If my struct is is pinned, then then misc is pinned too, right? And it would it would prevent us from doing all the bad things that that uh, uh, one can do uh, by doing the structural uh, uh, pinning uh, in, in projections, right? But it also allow us to to do something like this, where there's no unsafe involved. We can just do p dot miss dot register. We can go straight to the, to the register, which requires a, a, a pinned uh, mutable uh, reference. And um, with this, uh, this is the end of of it's right on time. I think uh, twenty five minutes. Uh, of, of our incursion into pinning. Uh, so if you have questions about this or, or anything else that, that Miguel and I talked about, uh, we'd be happy to, to try to answer. Okay, there's 